Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this talk. Um, uh, my, name, my name is Vikram, um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, how I use AI to make it easier for anyone to navigate and research city council meetings. Some background on myself, I've been building software for close to 20 years at this point, um, and I consult with early stage startups as an interim and fractional CTO. But what that means is that when I'm off contract, I spend a lot of time building things that I greatly enjoy uh, working on. And over the last two to three months, I've been working on citymeetings.nyc, which is this tool that I'm going to talk to you about. So, um, oh, the clicker's not working. Oh, hang on. So, City Meetings is a vast improvement over, um, uh, over trying to figure out what is going on in a city council meeting uh, using Legistar. Legistar, if you don't know already, is the city council's public record system. Uh, you can like search for bills and uh, resolutions in there, uh, but it also has a list of all of the, the meetings that the city council uh, is doing. And, um, so, so this is what Legistar looks like when you go to it. You have a list of meetings, you know which committee's running it, you know where it is, when and where it's gonna be. Uh, and you also have a bunch of links for you to go and understand, um, to dig, dig into the meeting, meeting and figure out what's going on. Um, so let's say that we want to understand a little bit more about what happened in this committee on technology uh, meeting regarding compliance with the open data law, which we've been celebrating all week. Um, so maybe the first thing you do is go to the agenda. You're like, cool, maybe I'll get a, an idea of what has been discussed, who is coming and testifying, but this is actually what you get. You don't get a whole lot of information on that. Uh, this is the agenda for that meeting. Um, so maybe, you know, because the meeting has ended, you decide you're going to look at the minutes because someone's diligently prepared those, written notes. Um, unfortunately, you get kind of more of the same. This is what minutes look like on Legistar. And if uh, uh, after this, you'll click on meeting details. And finally, we get to artifacts that start to feel a bit more useful. So generally, in this screen, you'll find like a few records uh, uh, regarding items that have been discussed at that meeting, like bills um, and other legislation. Uh, this is just a record, like T2024-0284. That's just a record stating there was an oversight meeting on open data compliance. And when you click on that, uh, you have a few attachments, including the committee report, some written testimony, and the hearing transcript, which I think is the most useful artifact when you need to study what happened in a meeting. Um, Unfortunately, if you are a casual observer and you just want to understand what happened, this is still not that useful because it's 86 pages long, and this meeting is relatively short as far as most council hearings go. It's an hour and 40 minutes long, um, so you can either watch uh, the video or you can read the transcript, uh, and it's really hard to understand you know, what was discussed, like who was there, uh, what questions were asked. So as a point of comparison, Here's what you see when you go to the same meeting on citymeetings.nyc. You've got the video on the top right, you've got the transcript on the bottom right. Um, you have a list of chapters. This meeting is gonna have like on the order of 50 to 100 chapters that are granular. They can take you to specific questions that people are asking or specific testimony that individuals are giving. Um, <clears throat> and when you click on any of these chapters, uh, every one of them has a title and a description so you can get a quick idea of what happened within like you know, a five to 10 minute second or so. So this is what you see um, there. As of today, um, and I started this work about two to three months ago, uh, I've done this for over 80 meetings, over 150 hours of city council hearings. I've created thousands of chapters with tags, titles, and descriptions. Um, I've written two newsletter issues that point people to specific, maybe interesting claims that were made in, um, in meetings or interesting questions that they might want to uh, sort of pursue and, and find answers to. And then I built a bunch of AI-powered tooling for me to handle all of the above. And I need to emphasize how like <laughs> impossible this would be if I wasn't actually aided by AI or large language models in particular. Doing this kind of thing today and bringing more transparency to Unstructured government data is a lot more cheap to do today. Um, it doesn't require specialized software skills, but it does require a bit more skilled use of language models, which is a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about for the next 45 minutes. So um, here's what I'll discuss. I'm going to talk to you. Uh, I'll give you all a tour of city meetings uh, tools. Um, 
then I'm going to give everyone a crash course on how to on language models and how to write uh, an effective prompt, because that'll be important context if you want to understand how precisely I go off and create video chapters in an efficient and scalable way. And then finally, for folks in the audience who have like a budget they want to deploy to a project like this, or are software engineers, or product managers, or practitioners who want to go and do something more ambitious, I'm going to share a few tips for how you might go about doing that. So let's begin with a tour. Um, so on the left side is an excerpt from my newsletter. Uh, I have a section for every single uh, meeting that I'm covering in that issue. And under each meeting, there are a few bullet points that link to specific claims or questions that you might be interested in. So over here, uh, I'm going to click on what does a 1.4% vacancy rate signify for New York City's housing crisis? And what that'll do is that'll open the uh, hearing on the 2023 housing vacancy survey. Uh, it'll open it up to that specific question. It'll open up this little panel with a title and a description, and then it'll seek to that point in both the video and the transcript. Um, uh, on the left side over here, you can uh, scroll through all the chapters for this meeting. There's probably, depending on the, the length of the meeting, there might be anywhere from 20 to like 200 chapters uh, that take you to granular questions that were asked or testimonies that people have, been, have given. When you click on one, uh, you can seek to it in both the video and the transcript. Um, all chapters have titles and descriptions uh, and small summaries. Uh, both the, the chapters as well as the titles and the descriptions are uh, generated with language models. Um, and then uh, on this bottom right, you can scroll through a transcript if you want to. Uh, like, let's say the chapter boundary wasn't quite right, or there's like a lot of hemming and hawing, or people are just like taking too long to get to the point. You can go and click on uh, any of these timestamps for any of the sentences to go seek to them. And then finally, there's the video in which you can see, you know, people's faces and the tone of the conversation, all of which are really important context. You want to understand what precisely is going on. Uh, finally, if you want to share something you find interesting, you can share permalinks to uh, either a chapter or a specific sentence, uh, thereby allowing you to share uh, a specific point in a meeting as opposed to a three-hour hearing. So um, building something like this is actually pretty easy if you already have the data. You can stitch a video, a transcript, and some chapters together in a few weeks. Um, but uh, creating useful chapters efficiently is hard. So 80% or more of all my effort has gone to populating this bar on the left uh, as efficiently and scalably as possible, as well as these titles and descriptions. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I go about doing that when I publish a new meeting. So when there's a new meeting on Legistar, I will first transcribe it. Then I'll take that transcription, and I'll run it through three AI steps, uh, between which I'll review and fix the results that I get from it. And so I've built a bunch of tools for that. So uh, the second thing I'll do is I'll identify all the speakers in the transcripts, like this is Council Member Gutierrez, or this is Chief Analytics Officer Martha Norick. Um, Given those speakers, I'll have uh, I'll run it through the, my pipeline that will generate chapters, um, and then uh, the last thing I do is I will create a summary also using language models, and then I'll edit that. Um, I'll review and fix all of those and publish it once I'm done. Uh, when I transcribe videos, what I actually mean is I'm transcribing them and I'm diarizing them. So. Diarizing, uh, or diarizationization, is just a fancy word that means um, identifying when a different speaker is speaking. So you'll see in this transcript, I've got uh, speaker labels for everyone who's spoken a sentence here. So the first sentence was spoken by speaker one, the second sentence was spoken by speaker three, uh, the third, uh, well, all the others were spoken by speaker five. So um, I have a sense of who uh, of, of, of uh, who has spoken a uh, given part of the transcript consistently over the course of it. Um, I use a third-party service to get my transcript. They're relatively cheap, but they hit like a good price-to-performance ratio for me. I, I don't have a ton of money to spend on this. Uh, but there are a lot of people, and I'm sure there are many people here at this conference today who can tell you about open source tooling that you can use. Two really popular um, libraries for this are Whisper and Pi a Note. Um, and I think, I'm sure there are folks at the conference, uh, the conference who can tell you more about it. I think if you talk to the folks who are working on Block Party, um, those are probably the folks to talk to because they, they transcribe community board meetings. I know they do a bunch of stuff uh, with transcription and diarization more generally. So that is transcription and diarization. And then I built a bunch of review tools. And here's a screenshot of like what I see when I go to a meeting and I want to review it. Like I've got, uh, I can delete chapters, I can click on one, and I get more tools. Um, but, uh, and I'll get to the specifics in a sec. Uh, yeah, let's just keep going. So um, 
the first thing I do when I get a new meeting, so this meeting is five hours and 20 minutes long, um, is I'll run my speaker identification pipeline on it. And then uh, I'll go through uh, all of these speakers and uh, review and fix them. Um, there might be spelling errors. They might be incorrect. This meeting probably has on the order of 40 to 60 speakers that have been identified. So I go through all of them. Um, sometimes, especially for testimonies, like the transcript gets names wrong. So I'll try and get those right. Uh, so once I'm done with that, I will run my chapter extraction props and pipeline over it. And then um, I use my tools to edit chapters and review them. So this panel in the middle is my like editing screen. I can select the chapter type. I can select the first sentence and the last sentence of the chapter boundaries. Um, I can change the title and description. And then at the very bottom, there's this button that says generate chapter details. I have a few other like AI helpers that will allow me to do, um, allow me to like use the AI to maybe generate a new title and description or edit it um, if, if I don't like what it came up with initially. So. This is what chapter editing looks like. I can also delete chapters. I also have a notion of like gaps um, on the left side. Uh, these are these like gray bars that say gap, and they show me if the AI like you know missed out a large swath of the transcript. So I can review stuff like that as well. And then finally, um, I will use. AI to also create the uh, first draft of my meeting summary. I'll review and edit it. And then this ends up on uh, citymeetings.nyc. Um, and uh, these summaries are, are vastly more useful than you'll find on Legistar. Like, you can see the general discussion that occurred. And then you can also figure out who actually came and testified at this particular meeting. So um, that is a tour of the tools that I've built for the public, as well as some of my internal ones. Um, I have a minute just to pause here in case anyone has any questions or wants me to clarify anything before I move on. Um, I had a question about the transcribe process. Only yeah. because you showed us the other document where it had the, um, the transcription. So I was sure why you had that. Question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question was, like, why are you transcribing stuff when you showed us that there's like official really great transcripts on Legistar? Two reasons. One, the transcripts on Legistar, they don't tell me where in the audio they occur. So it doesn't allow me to create the sort of seekable chapter or this ability to create a link to, to go to a specific point in a transcript or a specific point in the video. That, I think, is really important if you want to share specific points in a meeting. Um, the other thing is that those transcripts, they arrive quite late. And it's quite, it's like, it's at least a few days. And then at times, like, you know, this week I saw one was like two weeks late. Um, I do have plans to like reconcile those because their transcripts are better, uh, but I haven't really worked on that yet. But that's a good question. Yes? I'm just curious how long the editing process takes. Yeah, so right now, given the performance of my like speaker identification as well as chapter extraction, it takes about 10 to 30 minutes per meeting, which can be really long. Like that's that's a long time right now. Um, and I'm working on making improvements to those, and I'll talk about sort of how I plan on attacking those. But um, that is already, however, like a far cry from what would be required to do this manually. So yeah. Um, Cool. All right, so let's dig into, uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is language models, how they work, and then I want to talk to you all about how to write an effective prompt uh, before we dig into how precisely I create video chapters. So um, language models are uh, trained on vast corpuses of text, essentially most of the internet, and the way that they work is when you give them some it input, they will try and predict uh, the text that follows what you've given it. So. In this case, I asked uh, GPT 3.5, which is one of OpenAI's models, in five or fewer words, what is one thing I might enjoy as a five-year-old? And these were five different answers that it gave me each time that I asked. So clearly, uh, play has a very strong association in the language model with things that uh, five-year-olds might enjoy, naturally. Uh, and then I've got two responses here that I got regarding building blocks, which you know must be ranked probabilistically high in terms of the things that five-year-olds might enjoy. So it. Uh, it is completing text by predicting what might come next based off of all, like a ton of stuff it's been tra trained on. Um, uh, when I talk about writing a prompt, or when people say prompt engineering, generally what they mean is writing the system prompt. The system prompt is something you can give the um, 
uh, language model along with your message to guide its response. So in this case, this was my little literal system prompt that I used. I said, all your responses must assume the user is a pigeon. And then I've asked it in five or fewer words, what is one thing I might enjoy as a five-year-old? And then it's given me five answers, again, from GPT 3.5. Um, uh, these were five different answers that I got five different times in a row. So clearly, given the system prompt, uh, it has um, strong associations uh, with flying and feathers for uh, pigeons who are five years old. So, that is how system prompt work. And what we're going to be doing is figuring out how to write a system prompt to coax an LLM into doing something that we want it to do. And that's what prompt engineering roughly is. And that's what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> One artifact of um, how large language models work is that they can plain like, fabricate things or lie. It's commonly called hallucinations. I'm sure everybody in this room has heard of this, world, uh, this word at this point. Um, but uh, you know, it might emit uh, a text that is probabilistically possible, but is actually just wrong. Um, and this can lead to some pretty weird behavior, especially to for some of the more sophisticated uh, models that are out there. So uh, this is a screenshot from a paper titled Eight Things to Know About Large Language Models. Um, and they cite this other paper that talks about two behaviors that they observed uh, that language models do. One, sycophancy, where a model will answer uh, subjective questions in a way that flatters their user's stated beliefs. This is real human behavior, uh, likely trained on text that's actually on the internet. Um, and then there's another one uh, that they observed called sandbagging, where models are more likely to endorse common misconceptions when their user appears to be less educated. So I don't know what they precisely mean by their user appearing to be less educated, but you can imagine that if you start a conversation with ChatGPT by saying, like, why is it that 5G causes COVID, you might end up getting a bunch of stuff uh, after that that has other misconceptions because there's a bunch of misconceptions that neighbor a misconception like that in text that's on the internet. So um, there's some weird stuff that can happen because of this. But in your day to day, what you're more likely to see is that it'll give you, like, incredibly convincing answers that are completely wrong. And uh, uh, one thing you should never do because of the way language models work is to not use them as a search engine. They don't work that way. If you do that, what you're asking the model to do is give you a response based off of text that it's been trained on. Uh, and here is a response that is very convincing and completely wrong. There are many local law 90s in New York City. There's one for like every year, at least for the last decade. Um, there is not a single local law 90 that is part of the Green and Greater Buildings Plan. There are many in the 90s from 2000, sorry, in the 19 numbers from uh, the year 2019. Uh, and the Greener Greater Buildings Plan is something that has been discussed and talked about a lot. It's a very popular uh, plan. There's a lot of investment in it. So um, that might be why we're getting this answer. So don't use language models like this if you can. Um, and the other thing to do is to verify uh, language model output. Um, I'm saying all this not because, like, not to scare folks away, but to state, like, if you want to use language models effectively and responsibly, you uh, you need to fully acknowledge and embrace the fact that they might just lie. Uh, and what I'm going to talk to you about is how to mitigate some of those things and how to plan for them in, like, your product design or in whatever task you're doing in your day to day. So let's talk about how to write an effective prompt. Um, this is going to be a crash course. I'm going to talk through two lessons. Uh, two lessons uh, that I use to write effective prompts. They are foundational as far as I'm concerned. There are lots of tactics and strategies to make prompts better, but if you don't do these two things, you're probably not going to write a very, very effective prompt. Um, and what we are going to do is uh, write a prompt that summarizes New York City bills. Uh, the bill that I'm going to use as a, an example is Introduction 601, which is a law that requires uh, some city agency to um, publish an interactive map and data set of all the film production permits that have been published. Super relevant to the Open Data Week uh, and the Open Data Program. Uh, it's not passed yet. It's currently out. It's one of the open pieces of legislation. But we're going to try and summarize this law. This is the example that we're going to use. Um, and so lesson one is that if you want to um, get a prompt to do, if you want to coax a prompt into a language model to do what you want, you have to say what you actually want. And I do this in two ways. One, 
Um, I'll try to use proxies. I'm going to share one around summarization very soon. But a really uh, popular proxy is explain this to me like I'm five. And explain this to me like I'm five encodes so much in just those few words. It encodes the kind of vocabulary the language model will use. It encodes how long the sentences will be. It encodes how long your entire response will be. Um, it's a great prompt to use if you take a really complicated Wikipedia article and you want to understand what's going on. I use it sometimes. It's great. Uh, and then. If you want more specific requirements, if the proxy's not working, or if you're not getting consistent results, you need to start getting detailed and a little pedantic. So um, let us program the system prompt. Uh, you can assume in all these examples that we are writing that system prompt at the top, and then the user is texting, uh, is pasting the text from introduction 601. And then we are getting a completion from the language model. And that, this is generally called the assistant message. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to be working on this prompt, and you can assume that I'm always pasting introduction 601 in order to get the answer. So uh, let's start with our first version. Your job is to summarize the New York City bill that the user provides. I pasted in introduction 601, and this is what I got. This is not a useful summary. I might as well just read the bill. It's kind of long. It's hard to skim. Uh, I want this to be a little better. So. Uh, in the second response, uh, in the second version, I'm going to go ahead and be more specific. I will say I want to be able to skim the summary and understand it easily. And then I added this proxy that I use really often um, to write a summary in the style of Axios' smart brevity. Axios is a news outlet that um, summarizes, uh, that has like a very specific style around summarizing uh, a news story in a way that's very skimmable. Um, and these are all hallmarks of its style, like what's happening. They always have a heading like that. They always have like a bottom line. And then they always have these like bold uh, sort of headings for each bullet. Um, and this is already better. We have not really tried very hard. Um, but let's say that we want. Let's say we want something more specific. Like, there are things in here that I don't really care about. I don't care that council members Holden and Yeager have introduced a bill. I want it to get to the point. I want to get maybe the implications of the bill for a layperson. I want to get some of the key requirements if I care about those. And then let's also say I want to like extract some very specific pieces of information that are found in almost every New York City legislation. So over here, I've highlighted a few things. I've highlighted key figures like dates, dates that lawmakers and people must adhere to, when the law will be uh, in effect, uh, as well as um, uh, as well as like uh, uh, sections that it refers to in the New York City legal code. Uh, so let's say we want to get those in their own little subheadings. And so this is what a prompt like that looks like. I start with the high-level job. Your job is to summarize the New York City bill that the user provides. Then I give it a proxy. The audience is a New York City resident who wants to get up to speed on the law who is a layperson. You can imagine that if I instead said that the audience is uh, a, a New York City legal scholar, I might get a very different response. Um, and then I get really specific around, about the structure of this uh, of the summary. I talk about exactly what I want within each of those sections. And what I get uh, and this took me you know, five minutes to write, maybe 10 minutes at most. Um, what I get is something that's pretty good for Introduction 601. I've got the implications, I've got the law requirements, specific references to the legal code, key figures. Um, and that's great. But uh, what you'll find when you run this prompt that we just shared, and wrote, uh, what you'll find when you run it across a lot of bills is that it gets a little inconsistent. Like sometimes it will miss out on specific sections. It'll like miss out on references to the legal code. Uh, maybe it'll hallucinate over here as well, because we're giving it some opportunity to. It's like, hey, what's in 22205? Uh, if you want to fix that, and if you want more consistent output over a really large range of inputs, the fastest way to do that is to provide about five to 10 diverse illustrative examples of the task being done how you want it to be done. Um, this is where I spend probably most of my time to make a prompt good over a lot of inputs. Um, and it takes some time, but it's totally worth it. This is also where I get the highest leverage uh, and all my effort sort of comes to fruition. My, uh, my, prompt, uh, my prompts, when I add examples, they look like this. So this is the exact same prompt that we just wrote. It's completely unchanged. And then if I continue this prompt, I add a list of examples. I have a heading for every example. Under every example, I just give it the input, and then I give it the output. And I do this you know, some number of times. Um, and this can be kind of tedious. It takes a little while. But the best way to do this fast is to just like use your 
existing prompt to craft examples. This is a far easier way places for you to start if you want to add examples. It's also instructive. Like you will find out where your prompt is failing. And every time you're like, ah, oh, that's weird. It did this thing that I don't like. Let me add a direction and let me add an example that tells them not to do that. And so you can sort of iteratively get to a point where the prompt is working far better. So uh, that's how I do it. This is for a different law. I think this is for a law that imposes higher penalties on chain businesses if they fail to clear snow, ice, and dirt from sidewalks. So it works pretty well, but maybe you want to make some changes to this. Um, here are some examples that I would add uh, if I wanted a diverse set of examples. Uh, I would add bills with fines and penalties, bills that have complicated fine structures, very long bills. Uh, at the very bottom over here, uh, this gets a little more complicated. There are bills that repeal sections of the code. They put them in like square brackets in the, in the legislation. Um, you'll probably need to update the prompt for that as well. But here are uh, here's what I would target if I wanted a good diverse set of examples. Um, uh, and those are really the two lessons that I want you to take away. The best way to get good at this is to try it out. Um, I have plenty more that I'm going to talk through as I talk through uh, video, uh, creating video chapters, but these are the basics. Uh, some exercises you can do at home. Try and create the best bill summarizer you can. Uh, try and bring in the New York City legal code, like ask the user to paste in specific parts of the legal code, like section 2205, so that it augments the summary with it. One, uh, one prompt that I wrote once was to uh, see like what the implications of changes were uh, from one version of a law to the next. And I found some interesting things that were horse traded in the legislative process through that. Um, and another thing you can do is add citations, because as I mentioned, it's very important to verify your output. Uh, citations make that easier. So um, the other thing you can do when you are trying this at home is to try different large language models, which vary by capability, cost, and context window size, which I will explain in just a moment. They also explain, uh, they also vary by a lot of other things, but these are the dimensions and scope for this. Um, let's talk about capability for a second. Like all the major front runners in, uh, of language models that are out there are all made available by companies with very deep pockets because they are very uh, expensive to train. They're super expensive to operate. They're available via OpenAI. Google or Anthropic are kind of the three front runners at the moment. They have models that work really well. Um, but you'll be surprised if you use models that are so-called less capable, there's actually a wide range of tasks that they can still perform. Like GPT 3.5 costs very little money to use, and it is quite performant at a lot of stuff. Um, so try out different language models. Another note is that even within the same tier of performance, like there are objective measures that all of these folks release. They run them against specific reasoning tasks, like what was its SAT score? Or how did it pass the LSAT? Whatever. Within the same tier of objective performance, there's still differences in the quality quality of their performance for your specific task. So uh, try different language models, even if they're like comparable from an objective you know, test sense. Um, the other two things, cost and context window size. Context window size is how much text the language model can process at the same time. Some language models can process uh, a whole book, many books. Some language models can only process like a long essay. And both cost and context window size are measured in tokens. Tokens are not words. They're not syllables. They're not punctuation. They're not characters. They are how the language model sees text. Uh, so this is from like a tool that OpenAI provides. Um, uh, this is how a language model sees text. And when a language model is trained, they learn statistical correlations between tokens. Um, and this is important uh, because cost and context size are measured in those. And a good rule of thumb for OpenAI is that uh, if you, uh, a token roughly correlates to about 75% of uh, a word. Uh, here are some notes on uh, uh, like the three models, the three top models that OpenAI makes available. Um, OpenAI's most capable model is GPT-4 in the middle over here, and that's reflected in its cost. The cost of using a model varies by how many input tokens you have provided and how many output tokens it has generated. It is typically more expensive for a language model to generate tokens. These are measured per million tokens. Um, and then there's context window size here. I use GPT-4 Turbo. It has a context window size that'll fit my entire transcripts when I need to. Um, my transcripts are about 10 to 100,000 tokens. The mean is about 40 to 50,000 tokens. And I use GPT-4 Turbo for all of this. Um, cool. 
Uh, I have about a minute uh, to answer any questions before I move on to the next part, which is how I create chapters for city meetings. Yes. Um, not really about AI, but I was wondering if you had any plans about like expanding this just to like, get alerts about like meetings or like bills, for example, because like for example that bill you mentioned is actually relevant to something that I've been trying to work on, and I actually had no idea that had been introduced. Yeah. So I. Um, I'm, I'm, there used to even be a site like that. I think it kind of went dormant. Yeah. Um, so I just want, and also just like about upcoming, I think they have their own alert system, but it's kind of not very good. Like, Ledger Stars? Yeah. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so. Uh, I wonder if that's something you would think of adding with or without, with or without AI or whatever. Yeah. Totally. I definitely considered it. Uh, I, 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 haven't, I haven't decided to, but it's like on my mind, and I may at some point do yeah. that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was just gonna add to that. I think the like build tracking aspect of Red Star is like really, really pure and like you know, the city meetings are like so useful and incredible. And that's like another area that would be could be like just vastly, vastly better. Some of my earliest tests were all around bills. Like I tried to summarize them in ways that were more useful. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's something I'm definitely thinking about doing. I haven't started on it yet. However, if anyone wants to work on something like that, like that's a great exercise for, for folks to work on. Um, I was wondering when you have the transcript, do you keep the copy of the prompt that you use for it? It seems like it's something that you iterate on over time. I iterate on it over time. I definitely keep the latest one because I use it. And there are actually many prompts that I use, as I'll show you. Um, uh, I iterate on them. I try to keep the past few versions as well, uh, partially because I was preparing this talk, but <laughs> also uh, because it's helpful for me to look at at some point later. Uh, mostly, it starts to become like a challenging management problem. I'm like, which version of the prompt am I using? I don't really care about the old ones once I get something that is working. I'm sure there will come a point that I'm like, wait, what was I doing last time? I want to try that with a different model. Things like that. There's definitely differences between the prompts and how long they are and how expensive they end up being. So it's useful to keep them around uh, to see if like a previous attempt actually works better mm -hmm. as language models get more advanced and capable. Thank you. Um, can you say a little bit about your validation process? Like you mentioned that certain kinds of queries are more likely to produce like hallucinations, but like are there any patterns that you can use to identify that besides being a subject matter expert in like particular laws? Um, not that I know of, unfortunately. So, like, there will be things that that go like I'm not a subject matter expert in like you know what's happening in most city council meetings. So, uh, I'm sure that there are inaccuracies there. I'm going to talk about like how I try to deal with that and also why it's not such a big deal in this use case, but why it also might be in yours. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I, there are attempts to do this. I think. If you really care about the data quality, there's going to be ha there's going to have to be some human in the loop aspect for this. But you can also augment that by writing prompts to score them, or maybe use other data. And so I know that there are companies that are doing stuff like that, um, and all of those help sort of whittle down the amount of time that it takes for people to validate things. Thanks. Um, this is just amazing. Um, do you have a list of things that? tell city council to prove Legistar about that would improve your process? I mean, you mentioned like the transcript matching to the timestamp. Have you been talking with them or have a list of things about like, this is my wish list. If these things yeah. in government, it would make this tool that I, Civic Hacker, made. I have not maintained a wish list, but if you, I sat down and wrote it for 30 minutes, it would be like pages long. <laughs> so yeah, like there's a lot of stuff that I would like to do, and that's a good idea. I should talk to them. I haven't had time to like, do that. Uh, all right, last question before I move on. This is maybe a stupid question. No. If you tell an LLM to stop hallucinating, are they less likely to hallucinate, or will that? No, that's like, unfortunately, that's not a, uh, it's a good question. Uh, you would think they would, uh, but uh, it's very possible that like probabilistically speaking, it just goes off and says whatever it wants to say anyway. Um, so yeah, it, it's you can try it, but it won't necessarily always work. So, um, cool, all right, let's move on. Uh, so let's talk about how I create chapters. So the first thing I do when I create uh, chapters is I identify all the speakers. As I spoke about earlier, uh, what I do is I, within the transcription process, I will get diarized transcripts. So I have speaker labels for everyone. But um, 
Uh, what I want to do is know that speaker label three is Martha Nork, the chief analytics officer, or speaker label one is council member Jennifer Gutierrez, chair of the Committee on Technology. So I have this process to identify speakers. The reason this is important is that correctly identified speakers make chapters better. If I have a chapter that is like a, uh, starts with like a council member asking a question, then it's important to know that that is a council member asking that question. Um, and uh, as a reminder, this is what my tool looks like when I need to go and uh, update uh, all of the speakers over here. Um, uh, and when I started this process, what I tried was to throw my entire transcript in there. Because as you recall, uh, I, I have a 128,000 token context window that I can use for my transcripts, and my transcripts fit comfortably in it. So why can't I just like write one prompt and have it identify all speakers perfectly in the first go? Because there's enough context in there to figure it out. If you're a human, you certainly can. Unfortunately, what I found is that uh, even if an LM is capable of processing that many tokens, it doesn't mean it will actually be good at it. So let's go through this exercise together and let, let me show you some of the results. So here's a prompt that I wrote. Uh, it's in three slides because it doesn't fit on one. Um, this prompt uh, starts with a high level job, which is to identify speakers in a city council transcript. Um, uh, it, uh, uh, I, I give the high level idea here, then I start talking about the input that I'm going to give it. Then um, I go into what I want the output to be. And this is a relatively, um, I, ask, I ask the output to. I have a question. Is there a Melissa Vecto in the room? No. Okay. Right. Um, I have a, uh, I start talking about how I wanted to structure the output. Uh, I ask it to output uh, the, the identified speakers as JSON, which is a machine readable format that is relatively human readable too. And so here's an example of what that actually looks like. I have four fields, the speaker label, the name, the role, the organization. And then I go into specifically how I want it to populate those, uh, those labels. <clears throat> And then I give it um, I give it some tips like, hey, there are going to be transcription errors. Roll calls are prone to diarization errors. Roll calls are totally messed up. You might think roll calls are a great way to identify speakers. Unfortunately, all the diarization is messed up because people speak so fast in a roll call that they can't figure out who is speaking. So anyway, I give it a list of tips. And then here is output sort of from the middle of the pack. As there's like 40 to 60 speakers in this uh, transcript. Speaker labels 27, 28, 29 are all totally wrong. 29 I totally gave up on. Kimberly Olson and George Olkin actually do appear in the transcript. Um, these are the correct answers that my current speaker identification prompt gets uh, right the first time. Um, and you, as you see, you can get the name, the role, and the organization. These are, these are all correct. Same deal, 30, 31, 32, all totally wrong. Uh, you'll notice that's Kimberly Olson actually turns out to be speaker 32. And I know who she is, what her role, and her um, her organization. So, um, the reason. So, uh, so the reason that that this happens. Uh, the reason that it's hard to have long context windows. Uh, I think there are two reasons why this happens with with long context windows when you ask them to process uh, a vast amount of text. One is a fairly well documented phenomenon um, that uh, large language models run into, which is called the lost in the middle problem, in that they heavily weight. A lot of the text you give it really early on, as well as the text you give it at the end, kind of losing the context in the middle. And so I deliberately gave you some answers from the middle of the pack because they are all consistently worse. I get better answers at the beginning. I get them better at the end. The lost in the middle problem, uh, language model, uh, folks who are working on them are working on, on improving them. But this is a problem that's well documented today. Um, and then the other reason that I think this happens is because long, long transcripts don't leave any room for examples. If you recall in a crash course, Examples are the highest leverage way for you to get a prompt to actually work well and consistently. But if I've got 60,000 tokens in a transcript, um, I don't have a lot of budget for uh, creating good examples. I can create one example at most, and that's not very diverse. I even tried to compress my examples and said, like, here's a small portion of a transcript with some neighboring context that you can infer a speaker from. Um, I tried to do this. I kept working on it. I couldn't get it to work. So generally, when you want better results over large bodies of check text, you're going to need to chunk your text. And there are a lot of different chunking strategies that you can go for. Um, a really basic one in my case would be to say, I'm going to take 8,000 tokens at a time until I exhaust the whole transcript. And I'll try and identify all the speakers in them. But I don't do that because there are some issues with it. Like, what if speaker label 2 shows up in every single chunk? Like. Which answer should I trust? How do I reconcile those answers? So instead, what I do is I chunk 
the transcript like this. I'll give the language model a message to say, hey, identify speaker X. In this case, it's going to be speaker 7. And then I will assemble instances of every time that speaker has spoken with a little bit of neighboring context, like one sentence before and then one sentence after. And that's what an instance looks like. This is a really obvious one. Like speaker 7 is going to be council member Brewer here. Uh, and so generally, uh, in one of these instances, there will be enough context to figure out who that speaker is, and I will get like maybe 4,000 tokens of instances um, there, so that hoping that like you know the, the answer is in there somewhere, and it usually is. So that's what that looks like. Um, and then the other thing I do in order to improve the performance of um, my prompt is I tell the language model to think. And this is a weird uh, technique called chain of thought that's widely used. Um, over here on the left side, this is a screenshot of a tool that I've built to evaluate my responses. I'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, but on the left side is the chunked input for a speaker six. So I'm saying identify speaker six, and then I give it a bunch of instances of speaker six speaking with neighboring context. And then on the right side over here is the uh, output from the language model, given the prompt that I give it. I will share the prompt separately. It's like really long. I'm not going to go through all of it, but I'll share it in a sec. But this is the output. So I ask it to give me a few different sections in its output. First, tell me who you are identifying. So I'm identifying speaker six. Then I say, um, start thinking in this section titled start internal thinking. And here it gives me all of the evidence that it has uncovered regarding uh, why speaker six is probably speaker Adrian Adams. And when I ask it to think step by step through this process, I reliably and measurably get better results than I do when I don't. This is widely documented, and it's pretty weird to think about, given the context that like, language models are predicting text that comes next. Uh, but it works pretty well. Um, and it also has the second benefit, which I love. It tells me like when sometimes like the reasoning just goes totally off the rails. And when that happens, I have a great example to add so it never does it again. Like, and that's a great way to observe what's happening and iterate on your prompt. So that's how it did it. My prompt is available over here. If you go to citymeetings.nyc, at the top, there's a banner. Um, and it links to like the resources. Uh, so I'll put the, can leave this up here for a second if you want to take a look right now. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, this prompt is 8,000 tokens long. I have very specific directions, uh, many examples, and I use chain of thought. Uh, but yeah, all of these are going to be available in resources on citymeetings.nyc. There's a banner at the top of the link. <clears throat> um, I didn't get there within a day. It took me a while to iterate to a prompt that worked really well consistently. Early on, I was like learning how to do this, and it felt like voodoo magic. And I was like trying to type in the right incantation for it to get good answers. And then I'd like print out results to a screen, and I'd inspect them. And it just took me forever to understand if it was working and if it was not. It was really hard for me to understand if it was working over a wide range of inputs. So what I did was I asked a partner of mine to uh, hack this tool together that he put together in like an afternoon that allowed me to uh, evaluate very quickly a very large set of responses. So I spent three days like iterating on the process, iterating on my prompt, and then like clicking these check boxes on the top right to decide if the format, the name, the role, and the organization was correct. Then I'd analyze the incorrect answers and I'd update the prompt systematically. Um, I started this on a Tuesday, and then by the time I got to like that Thursday, I got to about 80 to 90 percent accuracy. And this is really like the only way to get a prompt to work well consistently. Well, I don't want to say the only way. I'm sure there are others, but this is uh, I just could not do this in any other way. It's really important, I think, to systematically and, uh, and regularly evaluate your LLM results if you want them to work consistently over a very large range of inputs. There are tools that people are building to do this. A lot of times people do this in house or they build their own tools. Um, um, check out this blog post in it. Um, I want to share a couple of small snippets where I talk about specific uh, issues that I found <coughs> in the examples, as well as solutions that I implemented. So what I found was that it would fail to draw conclusions from really basic neighboring context, like I'd like to pass the mic to council member wrestler. Um, 
And so what I did was I added directions and examples showing how to infer who uh, the speaker is based on neighboring context. And then I would like eliminate that whole class of error because like it worked really well. Then I would find out like council member Ose is commonly trans mistranscribed as Jose. Council member uh, Adrienne Adams is commonly uh, uh, mistranscribed as Adrian Adams. So I provided a list of council member names. I added directions to infer mistranscriptions. And then that entire class of errors basically went away. So you just do this systematically, and you'll get to a point. It's, it's kind of just like, it takes a while. It's a pain, but it works. Um, <clears throat> And so that's speaker identification. Once I am done with identifying speakers, I have uh, I start creating my chapters. And so my current solution for my first pass of chapter creation is, uh, is it has three distinct steps, which is a chain of prompts. It's really common to, at some point, break a problem down into multiple different prompts and then chain them together. Creating chapters turns out to be quite complicated for language models to do. So what I had to do first to make this really good was I had to figure out what actually makes a useful chapter. I started writing prompts to do this. I started like writing out descriptions, like a chapter will stand alone. It's easy for people to get, like I didn't have a very clear, articulate sense, or like, I didn't have a very specific sense of what a chapter would be, and I tried writing a prompt to do it. And then it would emit these chapters that were like too long or too short. And then when I read my prompt, I was like, well, I don't know, these chapters are technically correct. Like I can't say they're not, you know, they don't really conform to the prompt because my prompt is too vague. So I sat down and I decided, let me figure out what a good chapter actually is for my use case, citymeetings.nyc. I went and manually created about 300 chapters over several meetings to figure this out. This is what the tool looks like. I would like uh, go to a meeting, I'd click on new chapter, it would allow me to select the boundaries, and then I'd click on generate with AI, and then it would write the title and description for me. So meanwhile, while I was doing that, I was also doing some useful work. I published a couple of meetings this way. But after this, I figured out, well, Look, a good meeting, city meetings chapter, it starts at the beginning of a council member's question, an individual's testimony, standalone remarks by a council member, or a procedural section of a meeting. Um, and I have one prompt that deals with this. What's the start of the chapter? And then my next prompt deals with this, um, figuring out the end. So um, these uh, the uh, city meetings chapter ends kind of at the beginning of all those starts that I talked about. The only weird one is the question where Really, I want the exchange that answers a question, not like the answer immediately after. It's common to have an exchange with many questions that, uh, that starts to answer a question. So I want to capture all of that. And then finally, a good chapter has a useful title and description. Questions, for example, I want the titles to be phrased as questions. It's easier to see in the bar um, and skim it. Uh, the description should answer it based on the context in the transcript. Um, and it should also mention who answered it, because it's not citymeetings.nyc giving you an authoritative answer on what the significance of a 1.4% housing vacancy rate is. It is HPD. So I want it to be really clear that that is what's happening here. And then I have you know, some other directions for testimonies, remarks, and procedure. Um, so my first step. I extract transcript markers. So chapters start at transcript markers. I call them transcript markers because I don't want uh, this process to get confused. I don't want to talk about chapters. What I want it to figure out is, give me the start of these questions. Give me the start of these testimonies. Give me the start of procedure. Give me the start of standalone remarks. Uh, I will share all these prompts. They're also kind of long. Uh, they're in a, they're in a link on City Meetings on NYC. Um, the, um, what, what, this, what this prompt emits is a list of these transcript markers. They all have a type. Then they all have time markers, um, which I'll explain in just a second. And then they all have marker information that is different based off of the type of the transcript marker. So for questions, I get the question, who it's asked by, who it's answered by. And then for testimonies, I also get the name of the speaker instead. Um, so what I do, with, oh, well. When I provide, I want to talk about time markers for a second. When I provide context to this prompt, I provide, uh, when I provide my transcript, I provide it in this exact format. You will notice that the speakers are now identified because I've already identified them. But then <clears throat> what I also do is I provide these time markers for every sentence in the transcript. The reason I do this is I started with timestamps. These are just timestamps. Like, you know, that particular sentence might have been asked at 23 minutes and 42 seconds. But when I put in 00 colon 23 colon 42 and have timestamps across this, 
the LLM would consistently just hallucinate random timestamps. Like I just didn't have stuff I could use. And I have used a trick like this pretty like frequently where when there is something that a LLM might have been trained on, like there's a lot of timestamps on the internet, so it's liable to just make up timestamps, create your own language, like create your own thing, and then map it back to what you're trying to do. So these time markers just map to, to uh, timestamps, but they are more reliably, uh, the, the LLM does, it, does a better job at, at not making these up. <laughs> so that's why I do that. Um, now, given the transcript markers, sorry, this text is really small on the left, but that is the output from the transcript markers. It's a list of them. I have a different prompt for questions, testimonies, remarks, and procedure to determine the end of those chapters. So I go through them one by one, and I reprocess that, that particular transcript. So this is step two, four prompts. Um, then finally, I've got chapters. So now I want to write the titles and descriptions. And I do a little bit of like editorial work in here. Like uh, That's where I say, like, hey, make sure you always mention who it is that's asking the question, because it's not city meetings, not NYC. Um, so the inputs to this are the chapter type, the chapter start, the chapter end, uh, the marker information as well, the transcript. And again, I have a different prompt for each of these, uh, because I want those chapter titles and descriptions to be written slightly differently. All of the prompts are available over here, again, on citymeetings.nyc. I'll leave this up for a bit if you want to use the QR code, but they're all they're online. Um, uh, two caveats are uh, each prompt is actually code that uses Instructor, which is a Python package for the developers in the audience. Um, Instructor is a fantastic way to reliably get structured data from language models. You can embed the schema of your response with the uh, prompt itself. It's awesome. Uh, for the non-developers on the audience, this is still legible. There's a lot of like just English text in there. And um, you can, uh, uh, this is still totally legible. Just imagine that all of that code is just like in the system prompt. That's more or less what is happening in the background. The second thing is I have just not had time to iterate on this systematically. So I walked you through how I iterated and evaluated the speaker identification prompt. I'm not there with this. This is actually a little more complicated because I have to evaluate three steps. And um, I haven't gotten to that point. But I'm at the point where I'm ready to more systematically evaluate it. As I mentioned, I think someone asked a question about how long it takes me to review this stuff. Sometimes if it gets to totally wrong, which it just does, it just takes me a long time. It takes 30 minutes to handle a five-hour meeting. And right now, it's budget hearing season. So there are like seven-hour hearings or five-hour hearings. There might be 20 a week. It's like, it's painful. And that's why I'm not caught up at the moment. Uh, but my plan is to get this down uh, as much as possible. So that is, uh, that's that. Um, my current cost to do all this work per meeting is about five to ten dollars because I'm reprocessing that transcript repeatedly, um, and I do that. To, uh, that's how much it costs for me to identify speakers and extract chapters from one meeting, um, and this is without any optimization. So you might be looking at this. This is kind of an alarming number. You're like Vikram, are you going to spend five thousand dollars to do this this year? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, uh, but if you'd like to pay me to do this, I'd welcome that. But the um, uh, I'm, I'm going to actually optimize this, and there are plenty of paths to do that. I am doing all of this uh, in the most basic sort of first pass way possible. Um, here are some ways I can lower costs. I can use different models. I use GPT-4 Turbo, a relatively more expensive model, to do everything. GPT-3.5, quite effective at doing basic writing when it's prompted well. Um, so I can, I can use that and eliminate a whole swath of my costs. I can fine tune a model. This is a concept where you take a less capable model, and with all your data for your specific use case, like I have thousands of chapters, I have uh, thousands of titles and descriptions, I can take all of those, I can fine tune a less capable model, uh, and make it trained specifically for my task, and it will cost me less to operate that than it does for me to use GPT-4 Turbo. Uh, fine tuning is out of the scope for this talk, but it's one of the things I want to work on in the next few months. Um, the other thing I can do is I can like do micro optimizations, like try fewer passes. Maybe I can like write the title and the summary and also find the end of the chapter in one go. Uh, there's a trade-off there, like you might lose quality. So uh, there's work to do there. The other thing to do is just wait. Like costs are falling precipitously. Like I tried these tests last March, and given the costs last March, I would not have done this. Come December, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll happily try this out. I can put in some budget for this. Um, so I'm just going to wait, and hopefully it'll get better. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up the talks. I've only got a few minutes left, but I'll be around the whole day. I can also take conferences right after this. I want to give you all a few tips for, to approach more ambitious projects that use language models. So this is for people who have budget they want to deploy to stuff or who are software engineers or product managers or technologists or otherwise who want to go and do something bigger using AI. So, uh, my first tip for you is to start really simply, like learn how to walk before you run. Um, just get one prompt to do one useful thing well enough because you will have done a lot of things in that process. You will have um, figured out how to write a good prompt. You will have uh, probably built maybe some tools for you to evaluate your work across a wide range of inputs, which is going to be really important, even for one prompt. Um, you will have embedded your prompt in a real, like, thing, like a user will go use it, you will determine if anyone cares. Uh, in my case, I was the user for a lot of it, but um, but yeah, start there. You'll learn a ton of stuff, then get a little more complicated. But once you get to the point where you have figured out your basic approach to solving a problem using language models, uh, it's time to set up some way for you to systematically evaluate your prompts, because it will allow you to iterate on your prompts much more quickly. Um, it, right now, it is hard for me to make a change to my chapter extraction prompt because I don't know if I'm making it better or worse over a wide range of inputs. Um, so you want to be able to set this up early. I have set this up for speaker identification. I have not yet set this up for chapter extraction. I'm now at the point because I have something that's like a good baseline. It's working pretty well. Um, Three, this is really important, and this is a product design problem. It's not an engineering problem. It's not an AI problem. It's not, it is an entirely product design problem. You have to fully expect that your, that your prompts might just lie. And uh, there are a few strategies that you can take here. You can decide they don't matter, in which case I'm really happy for you. You have a really easy use case to deal with. More likely than not, you will have to handle fabrications or situations where things are inaccurate. And the way that I do that is I review the speakers, I review the chapter titles and descriptions to the best of my ability. But at some point, things will uh, fall through the cracks, uh, in which case I give users an out. It's like not the worst thing in the world if the answer is wrong in the title or description. The transcript is right there, the video is right there, and a user can go and verify that. Um, this is also not like information that people uh, are relying on for, for you know, uh, Generally, people who are researching and want to know what's going on in city council meeting will probably be willing to go and go the extra effort to be like, hey, is this actually right? <clears throat> so I give users an out. Final tip, optimize for cost later within reason. It's hard to get prompts to do what you want them to do. You will get a leg up when you use more expensive, more capable models. Um, and uh, a, uh, a good idea is to do this for a while, get a baseline, and then uh, you can also use all those better models to give you training data to like train your own data sets. And so start there. Make sure you have like it, it doesn't cost that much money. I, I don't know. It, it's not it's not terrible. Um, but start start there. Get a baseline. And if you realize the baseline is too expensive and you're never going to get it cheap enough, then like bail on the project. You've learned something without spending a ton of money. Um, and that concludes my talk. Um, there are a bunch of links and resources on citymeetings.nyc on that page in particular. There's a banner at the top. If you enjoyed this talk, please tell people about it. Uh, and if you're excited about city meetings and bringing more transparency to city council meetings, bills, and things like that, please subscribe for the newsletter. I've got a bunch of these really cute pins over here. I've like, I've, I've been carrying on 50 of them. If you want one, please let me know. And feel free to reach out to me over here. Here's me on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and threads. Uh, thank you so much. I think I might have like four minutes to yeah, take minutes. questions. Yeah. Yeah, with regarding reducing costs, um, you know, human transcription services are, are still a thing. So I think I know you say you didn't want to get into fine tuning, but it seems like the path of least resistance is pay a human transcription service and then use that to fine tune a smaller model. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I don't think I will need to pay them because the city council already does. I have real transcripts that I can try and match. Oh. And there are, uh, I'm, I'm looking into methods to match up my inaccurate transcripts with those correct transcripts. One really fun thing that I've worked on before is uh, using metaphones, which are a way to map words to similar sounding words. Um, I wrote a blog post about this. I can share it. It's on my blog. But uh, uh, there's ways to do that without even using like language models, which are pretty cool. So I'll be trying that out at some point. Yes. 
I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts on uh, how you could better cross-reference uh, legislation or references. Because like you shared this trick with uh, sharing the list of council members to to reduce errors of identification. But like there's just a lot more body of law. Right? Yeah. So it, it doesn't, doesn't seem like the scaling seems to be an issue there. Yeah. So is the question, um, how is it that you can bring context from legislation to improve or, or like, could you like? What are your thoughts on improving the cross-referencing of other laws or like other parts of the city code or like federal code, those kinds of things? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, um, uh, what are your thoughts on um, referencing city laws and bringing other context into this? Let's ground this in an example. Like, let's say that. Um, Let's say we're watching a hearing, and I want to be able to, like, in a chapter, throw links to specific pieces of legislation. Like, like this is what the legislation is about. Uh, I haven't even scratched the surface of what things you can do here are. There are some advanced um, techniques here. Uh, one really popular one is called RAG, or Retrieval Augmented Generation, where uh, your first thing that you do is you take like you can take the chapter and you can shove it into a, a, um, a search engine and say, hey, give me all the bills that might be related to this thing, and then write about it. Um, that it's a complicated. It's it's it's. Uh, I'm doing. I'm not doing it justice here. It's actually easy to understand, but it's complicated and difficult to implement to get it to be highly relevant and useful. But anyway, those are my thoughts. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you consider publishing the data you're producing, or have you decided? Um, yeah, essentially, that's the question. I've considered it. Uh, so the question was, uh, would I consider publishing the data that I'm producing? I've definitely considered it. I haven't made any decisions on it yet. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, you you mentioned like reducing cost, and I wonder if you have uh, at all considered using other NLP techniques for certain aspects of. Uh, the process, such as like when they like, have like classify the different chapters as like a remark or um, like a question, and you like toy around with like using just like a classification model that like doesn't require uh, GPT four to do that. I have not toyed around with that, uh, partially because like I'm not a skilled NLP practitioner. Um, so it would take me longer, uh, but that is a really good idea. And like products do do this. Like one of the other advantages advantages of doing this is like when I'm like doing chapter review and I click on a button for AI to do something, it takes like seconds. Yeah. And so these models are can be faster, they can be cheaper, but uh, at the cost of more upfront effort to make sure it's correct and like deploying those models and things like that. So uh, because I'm just one person, I've kept it simple at, at greater cost. So. Yeah, but that's like, a good idea. It, like, I think the difficulty with that is that you wouldn't have like the data to go over. But like now that you produce so much data, it seems like you'd be able to like create your own thing to like be able to answer those questions. It's like, really cool. One hundred percent, and that is that is like that is one 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 strategy that I can take to to lower costs substantially. Um, I just got a time is up uh, flyer. So thank you so much for for coming to this. I really appreciate it. Uh,